I was in the office working, and all of a sudden I had cars coming up, a lot of cars and a lot of noise outside. I look outside, a whole maybe 50 Jeeps. Who comes out of the first Jeep? General Eisenhower, General Patton, and General Bradley for inspection. They went through every office. They, I guess they had to inspect it. I don't know what they were doing anyway. First thing, they, my office was the first one in the building. They came to me, Eisenhower, with uh, the translators. And they asked me how I, he asked me how I'm doing and all this. They translated. It didn't take long, two few minutes. And I told them all the story. Shook hands with me. All the generals shook hands with me. And I wa didn't wash my hands for a year. <laughs> 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 okay. Anyway, it, it wasn't long. Maybe five, ten minutes. That's about it. And they went from office to office and they talked to the people and they left. Uh, after a while. The advertised, that was in 45. We were liberated April 27th, and this was maybe in June or July. Just a couple of, General Patton was killed two weeks later, after I, after I had seen him. He was killed for his driver, drove my Jeep over that cliff somehow. Anyway, after a while, they came, all the recruits came from Australia. People were wanting people to go to Australia. You could go to Australia the next day. They pay for everything, just go, come. They needed people in Australia. And trains were going from Germany every day to different countries. People from all over Europe were there. But they, but they brought in from slave labor, from all kinds of work, working in the fields, whatever. And trains were going every day. Somebody came. And they, some from the United States, I forgot what. I want you, we want you to register if you want to go to the United States, we want people there too. So I said, okay. So I registered myself, my brother, and, uh, and uh, my wife. Meantime, he went to Poland. When I came back, he went to Poland to see my father. He was in Poland, he was stuck there. Uh, they had a lot of trouble. They had to move the factory to old Krakow because some of my friends were killed by the Polish underground. Some of my best friends were shut down. Anyway, they had to move from that town. It wasn't so easy. It was very hard. Yeah, after the war, yeah. After, that was after the war. And he got a hold of a kibbutz. They, they had people coming from Russia and from all over to go over to Israel. They had to smuggle them through Germany, through Czechoslovakia, and to Germany from Poland. And he was doing the work. He was doing the work, he was working for them. He was smuggling people to Germany, to the, you know, all over, the, all the borders. They had paid off. Uh, how you call Haganah? Briha. Briha, okay. Part of the Haganah. He was working for them. And uh, he wound up in jail, but I'll come to that later. Anyway, I registered. Meantime, I got married. When he was there, I, I, Eisenhower left. He left orders. All the villas around, there were millionaires, Germans, because it was so crowded in the camp. There were no room. People were squeezed. He ordered all the German villas emptied. They threw Germans out. And he, the people who used to come, they took out people so they won't be so proud. They gave us room in the villas. And I won't put an a villa on top of the hill. I had a room, I got a room there. That, me and my two friends, he was in Poland by then. And that's in the same building, same uh, villa, two girls were there. They were also in camp. And they look, one of them was looking for her brother. So my, my wife, future wife, was with her. And I got acquainted, and we walked around for a while. And we got married in Germany. When I registered with all my wife and everything else, it took months. Finally, they, come, call, they called me, they come in, I should meet them in the office, my office. CIA. German and uh, American Air Force in, uh, of uh, intelligence, Army intelligence, all kinds of intelligence soldiers. 
officers came interviewed me and my wife in her room separate in my room they interviewed us and maybe three or four days mm -hmm. different officers interview who I am what no no interview they spoke all German uh, 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 lieutenants no I forgot the ranks but officers not the soldiers and then they didn't hear from them anymore after a while after I was married I found out they called me my visa is approved. I got a visa, I should come to Munich to the consulate and go through with my wife to the doctor to a check up, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm healthy or whatever it is. Physical. We traveled to Munich by train. It was not many half hour drive. We went and I, I, I got acquainted with the secretary to the consul, German young lady, spoke perfect English. And I got acquainted with her, you know, I, I, I talk to everybody. Nobody can pass me by me talking, hello, how are you, all oh, that's it. I talk to her, she's very nice. Anyway, I talked to her. Meantime, the visa came through, I went to the test. Meantime, my wife was pregnant, <laughs> my son was born, and my visa was for me and my, and my wife and him. He was not, not, I have another person, so I had to go to her, to the, to the consulate again. And I told her, I said, no problem, we, we include him, he include with you. And she take, took care of that. After, after, it took a long while, maybe two or three months. It was 1949. Nine. Yeah. 1949? Yeah. No, no, this was before that. Well, I don't know, before. I, before 49, because you were born in 49. Yeah. Yeah. So it had to be before. Oh. I had to go uh, to travel to Munich, interview with this, interview with this. And I always say this, this get like so. Finally, we got orders to come to Munich and stay in a uh, barracks from the German army. The empty barracks. All the lapidated place. Rats. Oh my God, it was terrible. My wife, my wife was crying, she had a little baby him. She was crying, she cannot stay, she was sick. And people who were waiting there for months for transportation, they had visas already. They couldn't leave because they didn't have the transportation to go. So my wife, I came home, I, I was there too. And I said, what can I, I couldn't do nothing about it. I said to her, let me see. I'm going to go and travel back to my camp that I was working with the food, with the clothes. Let me go back, and she needed some medication, so I had to see the doctor in the camp anyway. I took the train, I went over, overnight, and told the doctor, give me a prescription, and I went to my, the warehouse, and I took two pairs of nylons, nylon stockings. The German women will give you <laughs> the world for a pair of stockings. <laughs> so anyway, I went back and I took two pairs of stockings. And I, I, my wife says, I cannot stay in here. The rats are all there. I'm sick. The baby is bad. I went to that girl and I told her, listen, can you do me a favor? My wife is sick, crying, and there's a baby. I don't know what, I cannot stay here. Can you do to speed up my, my trip? I handed it over the two pair of nylons. Mm -hmm. She saw the nylons. She starts smiling. Her face lit up. Anyway, two days later, she calls me. The a bus will wait for you on downstairs in the barracks. We we'll drive you to the airport. You go. We found a plane, army transport plane, going from Munich to to New York. And two days later, we were on the plane coming here. Him, he had to travel to Hamburg to the port. He took army troop ships. Bremenhaven. Bremenhaven. Brem What's the difference? <laughs> What's the difference? You got up in the, the ship. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got on a ship. You didn't, you didn't swim here, did you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, he got on a ship. We got here within 20, one stop we had in Shannon Island, and we wound up in New York. At that time, it was Idlewild. It wasn't JFK at that time. So I got off the plane, and uh, two women were waiting for me with my name in the car, you know, and they told me they are from uh, Hyas. 
There was an organization who helped the people come. They took me, I couldn't, they got me through the customs, and they called that taxi, they put me in the taxi, and they told the taxi, I couldn't speak English, they spoke uh, German to me. And they put me to a hotel on Broadway in 70 seconds. I never forget that hotel. Hotel Marcel. And I was in that hotel. Two days later, they came for me with a car. We found a room for you in Newark. We're going to drive you to Newark. You've got a room. And there's the office of the highest. You have to report there every so often. They pay the rent and they keep pay you whatever you need for food until you find that job. So we went and uh, got a room, uh, Johnson Avenue in Newark, i never forget it. And I went there. 178. What? 178, Johnson Avenue. Oh, he remembers, he remembers the number. Now he remembers <laughs> it. He forgets everything else. <laughs> anyway, I got that room, and we were there. I was going, I was going to school in the evening. Every evening I went to school to learn English. I didn't give this up. I went to school every day. Three days, a week later, I got a job in Jersey City, a uh, 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 sewing machine factory. And I traveled with two buses, one to Newark, to Broad Street. Then I had the number one bus to Jersey City. Mm -hmm. <laughs> went there and I was there working. And in no time, they put me, made me a foreman. I had to do a separate, I wasn't on the line. At first I was working on the line. Then anything came back to repair, I, it's my job to repair. That's all I was doing. And this, it took about a year, I did something like that. After I, when I went to school, I met a man who had a brother here who had a wholesale place of floor covering. One of the biggest in Jersey. I don't know if you ever heard, Harry Rich and Company. Big, big floor company. He had his brother. His brother was here for a long, long time. He brought him over, and he bought him a house. And he said to me, where do you live? Hey, I live here and there. You need an apartment. I have an apartment. I rent an apartment for you. I have a nice apartment. Meantime, I was looking every week on the paper. When he's coming, it's, I knew the name of the ship. And every day I was looking when this is going to be docked. Finally, I found a day before the paper I, I could read. The, the numbers I know, they told me on with Pier in, in New York, the, general, the ship with that. General docked. Harm. Yeah, was uh, a anyway. Ship I and, huh. and in the same house in Newark where I lived, a man from Pennsylvania lived above me with his wife. In the uh, apartment above mm -hmm. me. There's Polish people, and that's uh, Polish I could talk, so they were got very friendly with him. And one day I found him, and he's coming. His wife was watching him, and my wife and me started going, went to, with the man, her husband, went to New York to pick him up. We went to New York, the guy was Pennsylvania. <laughs> I went, I took a train. He did not know where to was what. He didn't know anything. We wound up in Brooklyn. This was in, in Manhattan. <laughs> so I had to show him where to go. I'm sorry to say, he didn't know anything. I know where he was from. Anyway, it was very you nice. You were only here two weeks or something. I wasn't here two weeks. <laughs> I knew more than he did. <laughs> anyway, uh, he was, they were very nice people, very nice couple. After, after a while, I moved to the apartment where I told you. And that's why we lived quite a while. We lived there a year or so, something like that. After that, they called him to the army. He was he was uh, drafted because the Korean War broke out and he was he went away. He sent every month he sent the money, and the, he's gonna tell you what happened in the army. He was eating like a horse. He still does. <laughs> every time he had three, repeat, he was telling me I wasn't with him. Three times he went for repeat. Yeah. One time they took him out in his bed, sleeping, put him outside, his, his buddies, and he slept outside, he didn't even know. He was telling me all this. Anyway, he put away. Did you tell how they... No, he, see, 
That was in the West Virginia. Uh, yeah, he, he was an army of Corps of Engineers. They built pontoon bridges over the river and tested tanks and trucks over the river. They regulated the river, the flow, they tested uh, all the equipment was went to Korea. And why don't you tell him how, how you uh, you went, how, how he drafted, messed up? How no, he messed how, up? No, how he's drafted? <laughs> See, I got from uh, President Truman an they invitation, know the, an invitation they know how to, to report to the an draft invitation. board. <laughs> I went to the draft board. And I said, "I'm underweight. I can't speak English. I can't read English." He was a little guy. I told you. So. She, she said to me, uh, you know how to uh, sign your name? So I said, yeah, you're in. <laughs> that was it. That was it. Anyway, oh then he came back from the army. They will say, he was two years in the army. Under the GI Bill, he bought, he had some money. I worked. And the friend of mine, was I told his brother, bought him a house. He told me his brother will give me a job and his nephews the same business uh, uh, floor covering he gave me a job and i quit the job in jersey city and i after the job i don't want to praise myself i had every day a phone call come on back come on back come on back i said no i'm t i'm learning a trade so i will stay here and i worked for the company 30 years mm. and i learned that trade for so three years I worked with that. Finally, after 30 years, I said, I had enough. I'm going on my own. I had a lot of friends working with. And at that time, he came back from the army. <laughs> and me, under the GI Bill, a friend of mine was living in Hillside. She called me, the woman, I knew her from before, because I met her in Newark. I know her before. There's a house for sale across the street from me. You can buy it for very little money. I said, oh, he has some money, I had some money, and went and bought a house on his side. We moved to his side. That's why he was in the army. I got a uh, GI, bill. GI bill, a low, low mortgage, and we got a Good. Yeah. house. That, that, and I lived there 18 years in his side. After 80, 18, we were locked out. You know, we bought the house very cheap. By the time, till 80, after 18 years, the place tripled the price. Wow, good. So, that time was... So, uh, so finally, luck right. was on your side. Right, <laughs> finally I got locked out. Yes. So it only took, eventually it only took 30 <laughs> years, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a two-family house. So I rented the apartment upstairs and I made some money on it. Besides the prices on the I could afford to move out of Hillside and I bought a house in Colonia. Colonia. Mm -hmm. I bought a house in Colonia and they moved. Since I'm 40 years in Colonia, in the same place. Right. So that's the story. And, well, I, that's not the story. 20 years later, <laughs> I was in this country, 20 years. I got a phone call for the German consulate. I wish they would like me to come to Hamburg because they called, they called the commandant from the first camp. Not the guy who was wrong. A guy from before him was, he killed so many people. They called him and he's on trial. And they would like me to come to Germany and testify. So I said, of course I come. My wife was still alive. He was going to uh, graduate school. He graduated the MBA. So he couldn't go because they, were, they say you can bring anybody with you and they pay for everything. So I went there with my wife and, I, and we came to the airport in Hamburg. Same story, couples, young couples standing in front with my name on it. I went over, that's me. So they said, uh, okay, we came to pick you up. And they threw themselves. He is a, 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 a report, reporter a reporter or a writer, some kind, something like that. And she's a teacher, young, two young people, very nice. So I, and I start to go on to pick my luggage. No, 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 don't go, the luggage is in my trunk. We picked up your luggage already. And I went up to a beautiful convertible Mercedes. Mm -hmm. 
every they brought me to a hotel, and I stood in a hotel every morning. They picked me up, they brought me to the court. For three days, I went to the court and testified. One day, there was a, seven judges. One of them was a woman. And the, the officer, I testified all the stuff for three days. He one day he got up and started telling the court that I am lying. That I'm lying. The man makes up stories, he said. You know, they just stand up and so tell me, if you don't shut up, I'll type your mouth. <laughs> That's what she told him, the judge. So he shut up. And after that, every day she, they picked me up. And my wife, after three days the court was finished, they brought me the couple, drove me all the way humble, all the the side scene. I could stay there for as long as I want. Tell them what happened to the, uh, the man on trial. Yeah, yeah well, I'll, I'll tell them. Anyway, that couple, I told that couple that my wife don't want to stay here. She don't, she couldn't stay in Germany. It was, you know, she, she had too many she memories. Stay there. Mm-hmm. I had to leave. I went to the consulate, and I went to the consulate called the travel agency, and they booked my flight to Germany, to uh, France, and to Israel, and to uh, Czechoslovakia. I went, and I want to find those two nuns. Mm-hmm. I couldn't find them. I couldn't find him. Anyway, after the trial, I didn't hear from him. I came home, after maybe two years later, I got the uh, internet message from a, red- a reporter from Canada. He was writer, he was writing with some papers in Canada. He sent me 17 pages a transcript from the court's document. Every day, every time, every minute, he had listed my name on it, on that paper. I have that paper. That's why I was telling you. Even the man, when I carried him on my shoulder, he got shot. He's got that in there, too. The whole story. Two weeks later, I got a phone call from Canada. No, What's it's, it's, Canada? Long, it's longer than that, because it was, it was like 10 years later. 10 years? I don't yeah, know. Years later. years later. Yeah, I know years. I got a phone call from Canada. Canadian Mountain Police. I said, I wasn't here. What do you want from me? I don't know. Sir, don't be here nervous. We just want you to interview you because we, interv- we uh, investigate an officer, a German officer, who came illegally to Canada, and he mentioned your name. But they wouldn't tell me who it is. I was smarter than them. I know who it is. The only person who knew my name an uh, officer, German officer, is the guy who helped him. He was the only guy who gave my name. So I think, I don't want to tell him, but I, I knew who it was. You know why? Because he did something good. He know I won't say anything bad about him. So he gave my name to them. They told me, he asked for you. And I still don't know. He still, they still didn't tell me who it was. They still didn't tell me. I found out later, I, I don't know how I found out, somebody, he, the officer got eight years in prison. He was eight years, that's all he got. His family was very wealthy in Hamburg. They had department stores in Hamburg. And he had one of the stores. Very, very wealthy. One day, somebody came to his store and put up blood in his head. That was the end of him. After he got out of jail. The thing that amazes me is is yeah. how much you lived through, and every day you were you were surrounded by death, right. and every day was your your life was threatened. Right. Every day you every never day. knew. Every day you get in line every morning, you never know if that's going to be the day that right. the lights are going to go out. Right. And now you, you you talk about it. I don't think about it. I talk you know, about it. I, I don't yeah. even think. About it. Believe yeah. me, I don't even. Think about it. Because the amazing thing, like both of my grandfathers were in the war. Uh, yeah. my, my my father's father was was in the South Pacific. My mother's father was was in Europe. Um, my father's father passed away when I was young, maybe five years old. Um, and my mother's father passed away just a couple of years ago. But I don't remember either one of them ever ever telling me one story about what they experienced. You know something? A lot of people tell me their grandparents are parents. They were born here, never talked about it. They never mentioned it. When they heard from me, 
They say, we never know. My father or my grandfather was there, and they never mentioned it. A lot of people don't, don't, don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. I talk to myself. I promise myself, as long as I can, I'm going Because a lot of, every time I talk in the schools, I tell them, you know, people don't believe that Holocaust never happened. Mm -hmm. And I am here to prove that I am. And as long as I can, I'm going to talk to any, anybody who wants to listen. Mm -hmm. That's it. Have you ever come across any of the deniers, those that... that no. no, because it's still alive. And they would talk to me, you know. They <laughs> but, you know no, but you know why I say that is because See, there are... That's why I came on, I'm glad I said And that's why we're glad you're here. <laughs> I talk the same, the, the same way I talk to Germans. They were laughing the break. I talk myself about so many things. I was, the, first time, the first part I have, the first worst time I had, he wasn't there before I found him in the Gestapo school. That was the first, the worst time. My, I didn't know where my family was. I didn't know anything. And every day I had to deal with life. People, sh watching people shot and killed. And I had to bury him. And I never know where I'd be hung to. Mm -hmm. That was the worst part of this. It only lasted from June to October. Uh, that was none of After that, I got my experience. I didn't let anybody get away with it. I don't even have a mark on my hands because I fooled them. I was smarter than them. Yeah, from all your experiences, what you've told me, it almost seems like your day-to-day -day survival was was part luck and part because you have a silver tongue and you can talk your way out of anything. Most of it was luck. Look, luck, that's what's most... But other times, you have, you have luck, you have to help yourself. I talked myself... I talked to them, I made them sometimes laugh, I, made, I never got hit, I, nobody ever hit me, during this, all the years. And people, friends of mine, they got, some of them got beaten up, and terrible, because I always made, made them believe that I work hard. And it's hard to do, but I did. Mm -hmm. That's it. I was never hit either. L let me explain something else to you. I was grabbed off the street. All I had on myself was a jacket and a pair of pants and a pair of shoes. That's all I had on shirt. No, no, no. I, I did the same wait, thing. Wait a minute, let me finish. <laughs> he was different. He was with the family a year later. Oh, okay. I was a year already suffering there. Mm -hmm. He, when they took all the Jews out, he was with my father and my uncle. Before they took him away, my mother and my uncle gave him all the money they had. They didn't have much. He had it. And they put him back in the sawmill. He could buy something here and there. That's how sometimes he put food in the, in the sawmill. I had nothing. You know, I had nothing. And there I found a young man who were watching the geese in the, in the school of Gestapo on the other side of the forest, on top of the hill. I got a hold of this guy, and I gave him my jacket. He brought me every day a piece of bread. That's how I had myself. But I had nothing. Hmm? See, that's the difference. Okay. We didn't have uh, uh, food. There was none existed. No. That is, I just, they don't. I mean, but what when, I got, when I got to Pwashu, did you see me? I was a skeleton, right? Right. Okay. But in first, so, Benny, listen, I, I'm not arguing, I'm just saying, the first couple months or three months where I had money, you could buy some food, mm -hmm. didn't you? Didn't you or didn't you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I had nothing. Hmm. That's what I'm trying to explain to you, that mm -hmm. he had a little easier. Because when he was there, I was suffering, burying people, sh watching them getting shot. Well, right. well, even if you didn't talk about the finances, I think the emotional part that you each have is just something that you've managed to overcome. Right. And, right. you know, well, as, exactly as bad as both of you experienced, right. you're, you're both able to sit here with us today and tell us that you've made it. Look, look I have to repeat again. When he was a kid, when I... And I did that. I got him from the officer. He was a little guy, a little skinny guy. I could tell him he had to listen to me. Now I'm afraid to tell him because he's bigger than me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's 
sometimes happens with siblings. They get bigger than you, you know? Now, it's obviously the, the memories you have, the pictures that are in your head of your experience, and even the actual physical photographs that, that, that you've come across. Of uh, Last time we spoke, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you had shown me some images that you, you, you sort of I have. Guess, but, I still yeah. show them to you. Incidentally, I, I don't know if you know, this gentleman told me I'm a Lutheran. I said, I don't care what you are. The woman who interviewed me told me also that she's a Lutheran. The, the, the professor, mm -hmm. she also told me that. Mm -hmm. um, That's what I said. The, the, the interesting story I have about, about that is when I was, um, when I used to live in Scotch Plains, my wife and I were, were <coughs> members of a church in New Providence, a Lutheran church in New Providence. Mm -hmm. And there were two people of, uh, in our congregation who were from Czechoslovakia, oh, yeah. uh, who lived through concentration camp. Mm -hmm. um, and when she was liberated and they came to this country, she renounced her faith, and, and she converted oh, to no, no, no. Lutheran. Well, and, she, and to me, to me, that that is an incredibly powerful thing, I, where you experience something so yeah. intense that you, you renounce about, your faith over. Talking about, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Talk, I had a friend, a friend of mine, him and his brother. They were liberated with us together. I, I had faith always. I knew I'm going to go through it. I, I, live, I was an optimist all my life. And I had a sense of humor. I knew I'm going to go through it. I lived through it. Those people, when they're liberated, you know what they told me? I don't, Jewish guys, I don't believe in any religion. I'm not believing if God could do that to me, I don't believe in anything. That's what I'm trying not to show you. Everybody, so different left the war. I stuck, I stuck to it. I, I studied a lot of things before I, the war started. I studied, I studied religion. I said, I, I, you know, I belong to a temple. I like, I made, they made, and I don't know if it's to bless the wine for the congregation. I do it when nobody's there, nobody's a, a birthday. I do that in my temple. So I stuck to it. I was brought up that way. And some people didn't announce it. They don't want to, if God could do that to me, I don't believe in anything. It depends on the person. Yeah, it depends on the person, but I, I don't, frankly, don't understand. Look at the, be, look, because me, look at the two nuns, the Catholic nuns. Look at it, they know I was Jewish. What I was gonna say is that it wasn't only Jews who were killed. He saw a, 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 a priest being Yeah, killed. I told him. Yeah. So, so you're denouncing your religion. It happened to not only your religion, it happened to lots oh, of religions, yeah. lots of people. So, well, he, the, well, the thing, the thing that, the thing that continues to, to, to blow me away is, I'm 35. So uh, in, you look like 18. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but. My, this my high pulled the German so. <laughs> but my my generation, growing up when we were in school, mm -hmm. um, when we got to the point where we learned about World War II, it was, it was just the factual statement. This you know, uh, from from the American point of view, Pearl Harbor was how we got into it. Uh, these were the dates. These were the main players. Yada yada yada, and, and it just went on. And the Holocaust was part of that. But it was told on a factual basis of, you know, the, the six million were killed and it was done, you know, the, 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 the Nazis were, were these horrific people that did this. And, the, and it was almost whitewashed. It was just, it was just, it was, it was for school, I, it was for facts. And, and, I'm you know. not surprised that people mm. don't believe this. Human beings can be so bad. Mm. This is the shower room. This picture mm. of the shower room. The professor brought the picture mm -hmm. with her. And this, it had the rope down the middle. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, you can explain. But the the image that you're showing me there, I mean, the, the, those are the images that that I've seen my whole life. Mm -hmm. But it's it you know, when you're learning about it in school and such, it it almost looks it just looks sterile. Right. Yeah. To me, right. you don't see. Well, they, were, they you know in, in the, schools they don't want to really teach the gruesome details. Well, you see, this is this they is where they cleanse it. Yeah. They clean it up. That's the thing, and this is what I'm getting at is that. 
you know, growing up, you know, I had a certain image about, and I, I've always been a bit of a history buff, so I did my own research on it. So I understood the, the how horrific the, these events were. I don't get me wrong; I completely understood, but I never really had a clear, clear picture. And it was only a little over a year ago I found myself at home with my, my youngest daughter at the time was dealing with an ear infection, so you know, I had her home with me. My wife and my older daughter were out on uh, uh, attending a family event. And um, so I'm by myself with my daughter. And when you have a four-month-old with an ear infection, it's just, it's just a routine of antibiotics, Tylenol, and they go to sleep. You know? So I found myself on the couch with her in my arms, and I'm watching TV. And there was a documentary on the History Channel that came on. It was a four-hour documentary. And it was about the Third Reich. It was the rise was the first two hours, and the fall was the second two hours. And the, the thing that was amazing about this documentary was that all the sources for the images and for the and for the audio and all the, all all the research was made by citizens of Germany by the SS guards you know by the Hitler youth these were that that's where they got that's all the, the camp from. I was I told yeah. you the, mm -hmm. the P camp the spread yeah. was the old camp for the history of yeah. them but, they told but, them but the thing that that floored me is towards the end of the documentary when the Americans liberated and they started to you know the, some of the residents of the towns where the, where, the, where the camps were they 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 forced the residents of the towns to walk through yes. and, and witness what 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 had happened yeah. and this was the first time in my life that I that I had ever actually seen a, a, a color moving image of the piles of bodies and mm -hmm. of things actually happening and I sat there on this couch with my jaw on the floor. Because as much as you can be told about it, to see it takes you to another level. And I sat there and I said, and it had such an amazing impact on me. As much as it had in my, throughout my life, I understood it. But this just blew me through the wall. And I right. said to myself, why do we censor this? Because that's how you can get this across to, to, to people. But you that's know? exactly I mean, just, why he goes and talks to different schools and organizations, <clears throat> because when they see a person who actually lived through it versus the black and white from a book where, you know, it's very uh, cleaned up, mm -hmm. they, they speak fact, the person, they can relate more to it. Right. Would you believe, would you believe that where we were living through it, and we didn't feel it oh, yeah. because our minds were so used to it that it didn't bother us. Yeah, sharp people in front of me, look, it did, I didn't blink an eye. You were numb already. I was numb. 